And greetings. Happy Monday. Thanks for tuning in here today, live and on demand on Blaze TV, radio and podcast. My name is Steve Dace. There is Todd Erzin, and over there is Aaron McIntyre. Hope you all had a, a great weekend. Yes, I am risking my life again for you back here in the comfy confines, but uh, they eliminated those nests over the weekend or on Friday. They have not seen anything since. And we've got a spare studio, a backup set up. So in case I have to eject any vac, we can do that, not uh, miss or skip too many beats. So uh, I figured you guys are worth it. You guys are worth me risking my life for you by broadcasting from within our studio here. Todd and Aaron, not worth it, uh, but you guys very much worth it. So I'm here for you. How was everybody's weekend? It was great. Good. Excellent. Yeah. Well, good. good. Made the road trip across the uh, Midwest to the old confines of uh, Wisconsin. So yeah, it was good. I'm getting I'm getting emails from uh, people that are both fans of Arkansas and Oklahoma State and alums. Yeah. That uh, want to know what uh, what uh, uh, Junior Erzin, Junior Miss Erzin's uh, decision is uh, on where she will be uh, continuing her path to the future Olympian uh, at which of these respective universities. Do we have any news on that front yet? The decision has been made, but I'm not allowed to say it. She's going to be making it public within the next 24 hours, I think. All right. All right. I got it. I mean, I, I've, I had a person who's an Oklahoma State alum try to send in a last minute email to remind us, remind you that uh, the Boone Piggins Trust Fund is very available during this NIL era. Hmm. So something that uh, maybe the Erzin family wants to, uh, maybe you want to ride his coattails now As instead you know, of Steve Dace's. I'm all about the his, coattails. His, his coattails are a little, a tad more substantial than mine, I would <laughs> guess. I'm running from Yellow Jackets in my studio, and uh, he passed away a multi, multi-billionaire, right? So just a tad broader yeah. coattails. Your tomato, movie, tomato, right? The movie hasn't been released yet, so that, I'm, that I'm is, betting on the comp. That is true, and uh, the good news is we are getting restarted with that film here. Very shortly, uh, within the next month or so, it looks like. So i uh, heard from the directors uh, on Thursday. Uh, they are over the COVID. They both sound strong, and they are very eager uh, to get started uh, with this film. And I keep forgetting to ask you off air about the casting, because the last time we talked about it, mm-hmm. you threw us a nugget that is so interesting to us. So i got to ask you again off the air. Yeah, I, I'll give you the, the, the answer I have right now, which is the delay is going, I believe, and we all believe, to help us in the casting front. Now, this will be an expensive delay. I mean, we were already ready to begin rolling cameras. Uh, our, our sets are fully constructed, and now we have to pay for the space for them to remain so for well over a month and everything else. So on the cost standpoint, this movie just got... Uh, not insignificantly more expensive, but you know, we will handle that on, on the casting front though. I do think it'll be a benefit because now we don't have quite the, uh, the, the corner, the deadline coming around the bend that we had before. So at least that's what we're hoping and we'll find out here in the next few weeks. So we have two main roles in the film, uh, to still cast the two most dominant roles, including nefarious himself. So uh, but the good news is that train is is rolling again. It's been restarted. It's it's heading down the track. So we are excited about that. We're excited to hear from you. What you think about what we think. Steve at stevedace.com is how you can email the program. The um, the guy who sent to my house, or gal for that matter, don't want to misgender anybody, whoever it was that sent to my house for Sunday delivery, and this did happen yesterday, whoever it was that sent to my house for a Sunday Amazon delivery, a beekeeper outfit, a full regaled beekeeper outfit. Whoever did that, I am both impressed and I want to harm you. (laughs) And that's how you know that was a victory, my friend. Um, You made my wife laugh. I'll tell you that. Okay. She got a big kick out of that. All right. Big ass Amazon box arrives at the house on Sunday. Not that I just casually gave out my home address, by the way. And we, I'm like, I didn't order anything. Open it up. And it's a full, I mean, head to toe, the helmet, hat, whatever that thing is called, and everything. Full head to toe beekeeper outfit. Chef's kiss, man. That now is, you can multi-purpose this thing. Did you see the school board 
recently, the guy who showed up in one of these? I, You know what? I had forgotten but about that, go. but there you go. You're yes. the next guy. Yes. Uh, that was a masterful Trumpian level of troll. Masterful. All right? So, and I, I still want to harm you. <laughs> All right. Steve at SteveDace.com is how you can email us unless you're going to send me more beekeeper outfits. Do not. Uh, you can like us on Facebook where I will lie to you. Again, some of you need to be made aware of the fact I'm lying to you openly. All right. I'm not bearing false witness. I'm just openly lying. And I'm honest about that in order to um, trick. I'm sorry. Um, uh, honor. Uh, fake books algorithm i'm giving it the narrative that it wants so just take a 180 degree difference whenever you see hashtag facebook approved takes it's 180 degrees different from what i normally think okay my wife for the second time like she's like are you looking at this todd this is the great i work with him i know he's like this he's never been better than this he's never been better (laughs) he's gave up telling you the truth (laughs) and he's really gotten better by just flat out lying to people now yes uh, we tell you what we really think on Twitter uh, at Steve Day Show, or you can look for my name on MeWe, Parlor, Gab, and Getter. And if you'd like clips of the show that are free of both censorship and also uh, free of cost to watch, uh, rumble.com slash Steve Day Show. I saw Rumble hit a major milestone uh, for. Uh, for traffic uh, uh, a few days ago. So congratulations to Dan Bongino and all the team over there at rumble.com slash Steve Day Show. Of course, Monday, uh, our good friend Bob Vanderplatz returns, and he is somebody that once uh, almost successfully ran for governor in Iowa on using the power of the executive branch of the governor's mansion to put a check and balance on other branches or other entities of government that have decided that the Constitution just doesn't matter any longer. So I want to get his take on what President Biden is attempting to do and then what he thinks governors across the country, including our own, from our own backyard, ought to do in response. We'll get into that at the bottom of the hour. And then next hour, it is our Monday town hall. Uh, our, our followers on Facebook, you get to do the Ask Me Anything. And I am, I am curious what kind of questions we got After several consecutive weeks of using the Facebook platform to lie to people, I'm very curious to see what kind of questions that ended up generating in response from the audience. Todd has selected the questions we will answer on air, and we will get to those. Of course, I've not yet seen them, so I'll watch them and see them with all of you next hour on the program. But before we get to all of that, of course, we begin with Aaron's rundown of what happened while we were away. What happened while we were away brought to you by the real reason for Biden's mandatory vaccine plan. The New York Times had a heck of a Friday afternoon expose just conveniently one day after Joe Biden announced his administration's plan to cajole millions of Americans into taking the vaccine by forcing it on employers with more than 100 employees. The Times reported that the last known missile fired by the United States in its 20-year war in Afghanistan did not as military officials claimed, take out two senior members of ISIS-K. Who it did take out, however, was Zamari Ahmadi, a longtime worker for a U.S. aid group, along with seven children and two other adults. Video footage reviewed by the Times suggests he was not loading up his car with explosives, but with drinking water to bring home to his family. To boil this all down, the last act of war by the U.S. in Afghanistan took out about 10 innocent bystanders, including seven children. At a 9-11 memorial, former President George W. Bush, who started two wars, says, quote-unquote, domestic extremists are the real threat to national security. There is little cultural overlap between violent extremists abroad and violent extremists at home. But in their disdain for pluralism, in their disregard for human life, in their determination to defile national symbols, they are children of the same foul spirit and it is our continuing duty to confront them. Speaking of 9-11 memorials, Joe Biden had this to say while visiting one over the weekend. This idea that, you know, well, you know what do you want to do with Biden? I want to box him. I should be so lucky, you know what I mean? But it is the, the, the kinds of things or, you know, stuff that is coming out of Florida, stuff that's coming out of, you know, Robert E. Lee had been in Afghanistan. You're the one. No, anyway, I don't, I'm, I'm telling you too much. Let's listen to that one more time. This idea that, 
you know, slows you. What, what do you want to do with Biden? I want to box him. I should be so lucky. You know what I mean? But it is the, the, the kinds of things, or, you know, stuff that is coming out of Florida, stuff that's coming out of, you know, Robert E. Lee had been in Afghanistan. You're the one. No, anyway. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you too much. And now vaccine passports. In Israel, a hot mic caught the Israeli Minister of Health saying to the Minister of the Interior, quote, there is no medical or epidemiological justification for the COVID passport. It is only intended to pressure the unvaccinated to vaccinate. The United Kingdom is scrapping its plans to require a vaccine passport to live life for now anyway. This comes after months of public outcry and demonstrations against such measures across the pond. Meanwhile, back at home, the Surgeon General had this to say about the Biden administration's mandated vaccine plan. The data tells us that these requirements work to increase vaccinations. Number two, a lot of businesses <clears throat> are actually relieved that these are going into place. And we've heard a lot of feedback from the business roundtable and others that this will help create safer workplaces. In New York, Lewis County General Hospital in Lowville announced Friday they will not be delivering babies later this month because dozens of staff members quit rather than get the mandated COVID-19 vaccines. The newest Trafalgar Group poll of Biden's vaccine mandate plans shows 59% of respondents believe what he's doing is unconstitutional. 46% support state governor's opposition to the nationwide vaccine mandate, and 56% believe Biden's actions are setting a dangerous precedent. Jen Psaki, your thoughts? Why is it that you're trying to require anybody with a job or anybody who goes to school to get the COVID-19 vaccine, but you are not requiring that of migrants that continue walking across the southern border? But it's a requirement for people at a business with more than 100 people, and it's not a requirement for migrants at the southern border. Why? That's correct. Go ahead. A new study from the University of California finds teenage boys with no underlying medical conditions are six times more likely of ending up with complications from myocarditis from taking one of the Pfizer jabs than they are of ending up in the hospital with COVID-19. And finally, for something completely different, catastrophe averted. What we're watching is a video taken at the Miami Hurricanes football game on Saturday showing a cat dangling precariously from the upper deck of Hard Rock Stadium while a group of fans gather below with an American flag unfurled ready to catch the cat. Well, they caught the cat, who then proceeded to scratch and claw the living daylights out of his saviors. And that's what happened while we were away. Aaron's Montage brought to you by Home Title Lock. How much equity do you have in your home? Don't find out the hard way when cyber thieves, uh, they take it from you and you go to use it and it's not there. This is called home title theft. Cyber crime experts are warning about it as one of the fastest growing crimes happening right now. And here's how it goes down. Uh, first, cyber thieves search hundreds of public databases looking for high equity homes because that's where our, home's title, our home titles are often kept these days. Uh, next, they pull your home's online title and then forge your signature on a quick claim deed to make it look like you've sold your home to them so they can take out loans against your equity. Unfortunately, your homeowner's insurance, your mortgage lender cannot protect you. That's why you want to look at Home Title Lock. They are America's leader in home title protection. And today they're offering you a $100 value for free. You can get a complete title history of your home right now to make sure your home's title is still free and in the clear for free. Normally that's $100, bucks, but it's free to you today if you register your address at Home Title lock.com again that is home title lock.com today in the overtime we are conducting this poll on our twitter account right now at steve day show today in the overtime we will discuss the results that will be finalized here in about an hour we're asking you how many of you are willing to lose your job over the biden attempt at a vaccine mandate and we'll have those results, and we will discuss them today in the overtime. We record that right after today's live program for Blaze TV subscribers. You'll be able to watch it later today at blazetv.com slash dace. And that's also where you can go if you're not yet a Blaze TV subscriber but want to become one. So you get all of our content free of censorship immediately without any interruptions whatsoever. Uh, and all of the exclusive content as well available to you by being a subscriber today at blazetv.com dot com slash dace want to read to you a tweet from aaron carity 
Uh, Aaron is the director of medical ethics at UC Irvine. He's been published in the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post. Uh, also, First Things. That's, you know, typically see those three grouped together as publications where people are often published. Uh, but he tweeted out just a little while ago, and I want to quote. Um, I missed it. I lost it. Just a second. Here we go. Whereas evidence is mounting that vaccine efficacy is waning with time and new variants, there is no evidence that natural immunity for COVID recovered for the COVID recovered has waned at all during the 20 months of the pandemic, including against new variants. So there, to me, there are two methods to push back. And, and right now, if you can get yourself, if you want to, if you, want, if you can use a We the Patriots USA or a Liberty Council to acquire for yourself a religious exemption, then by all means, if that's what you want to escape this mandate, um, you should pursue that. OK, and again, I want to go back to what we said last week, what I laid out on this show. This is a separate conversation. We're in a new we're in a new chapter of this debate now. And, and just as last year throughout the year, we had to make sure we were drawing clear distinctions. We do not. We're not doctors. We do not know how to treat covid. Right. right. We don't. So we're not we're not discussing the pathology of the virus. We are discussing the public policy associated with it. And we are qualified to discuss that. That's what we do for a living each and every day. All right. So you need to make, we all need to make sure we're following that same path now, that same distinction as we discuss these vaccines. We're discussing these from a public policy perspective. Now, I did have a, a personal conversation with a public health professional this morning about this in my own situation that I think ties into this conversation. I'll relay it to you here in a moment. All right. But unless I make an exception like that, always consider we are discussing this from a public policy standpoint, not from your own personal pathology or uh, prognosis or whether you should get vaccinated or not. I will always answer questions of what I've encouraged other people to do, but I'm, I'm, you know, like I encouraged my mom to get vaccinated right away, for example. But that's a separate conversation from the public policy debate. There needs to be a clear distinction there. So from a public policy standpoint, if you want to be exempted from this mandate and you want to go the religious exemption route, by all means, um, we, the Patriots USA, Liberty Council, those are two entities we have featured prominently on this program that are offering their services to as many people as they can possibly reach along those lines. I have personally donated to both of those organizations to that end. Now, though, that's a short term, in my opinion, that is a that's this is my analysis. Now, that is a short term solution to this. Ultimately, I think we have two potential remedies here. One is what we'll discuss here at the bottom of the hour with Bob Vanderplatz. Counter executive action. Counter legislative action. So just about 20 minutes ago, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis announced he'll produce counter fines to government agencies in Florida that attempt to impose the Biden vaccine mandate on their workers. He'll counter fine them. That's an example of what we're talking about. Counter action at the state and local level. Uh, it doesn't even necessarily matter, a legislative or executive branch, but a counter action. A, a, a form of nullification or interposition, as our founders would have used that term. And in the Trafalgar Group poll that, that, that Aaron cited, I mean, what was that, plus 16 among the electorate in favor of states doing this? interposing on behalf of their constituents to stop this federal enforcement. Just to look at those numbers again and remind yourself that Trafalgar was combined the most accurate pollster in the last two presidential elections. And what it found was uh, those who thought Biden's attempt to mandate this by executive action was unconstitutional was plus 29, meaning 29 points more people thought it was unconstitutional than it was. Those who supported state-level nullification or interposition was plus 16. Those who considered this a dangerous precedent for any president to set was plus 26. It's, it's hard to get that sort of approval on anything other than do you think the sky is blue and is ice cream good these days, right? Yes. But you got it here on this. So to me, we have two long-term remedies. The first is 
counter action at the state level. Here's the second. We have to we have to win the argument on natural immunity. Because just as there's a distinction here between the public policy and then what's good for you on a personal health basis, there is two different public policy arguments happening. The first is the constitutional argument. The second one is well what it, medically are do we are we justified coloring outside the lines here? Right? Because those in favor of this point out, hey, George Washington forcibly vaccinated soldiers during the Revolutionary War. Now, you're talking about a far different time, primitive level of science compared to what we're dealing with here. But, but the argument does stand that there are, the Constitution is not wholly writ. I agree with that. So did the people who constructed it. That's why the first thing they did after they finalized it, they amended it. They amended it. That's the first thing they did. They amended it 10 times. We call it the Bill of Rights. It's not holy writ. The, you know, Moses didn't come down from Mount Sinai with a third tablet, and it was the U.S. Constitution. It's not holy writ. Remember, it was written for us. We weren't written for it. So absolutely there are moments in time where situations are so serious, something that we had not encountered before or some new threat to the human condition that didn't wasn't around at the time that they 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 pontificated this these things emerge that's why there's an amendment process that's why there's a convention of states an article 5 convention process so yes there absolutely are points in time in history were things that right now we don't think or the uh, the original intent of the constitution did not anticipate need to be addressed we live in an imperfect world that's why to me i actually think we have to win this second argument we need to win the natural immunity argument this morning you know i'm a big preventative health guy so i'm pushing 50 uh, I wanted to get a couple of pre-screens for heart disease. See, I also don't know a lot about my family history, okay? Because as you guys know, I was born to a 15-year-old mom. I don't know much at all about my biological family, but they're all Sicilian, so you can probably guess dietary habits, by and large, genetics, all right? Probably not the best, all right? A lot of high-fat foods, a lot of starches, a lot of pastas, right? Okay, so I decided to go over and, and get a preventative heart health a, a consultation done today, all right, in order to get, you know, a couple of, you know, fundamental or pretty run-of-the-mill heart disease pre-screens, like a calcium scoring, but this is what I had to do first, right? So I, 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 I really liked the gal that I saw this morning. We had a great conversation about my situation and heart disease and dietary habits and everything in particular. She showed me a couple things I didn't previously know because I am a unique case again in that I have a very high fitness level. Um, so my BMI score is not accurate. So they have to go by a different score where they look at what they call visceral fat, meaning the, the amount of fat on your body and where it's located as to how that pertains to your to health dangers up against your muscle mass ratio right so really good so what i liked about this is we were drawing distinctions it wasn't just you know one size fits all you're in a box right i got treated as, as an individual name steve with individual lifestyle issues choices decisions etc and so i thought this is the fi finally i found somebody i'm going to broach this topic with so she also did not ask me about covid didn't bring it up at all i brought it up to her and i said to her so my wife and I both had confirmed cases and recoveries with COVID around the 1st of May. Do you have any data about post-COVID post -COVID recovery vaccination in terms of how it relates to the volume of adverse side effects? Because we're not, re we're not reintroducing an inert form of the virus you've already had. We are, in, we are reintroducing the spiked protein the virus produces that you've already beaten. We're doing totally different methodology of vaccination. So I told her flat out, I am concerned. I'm, I'm, I'm heavy into research. And she could tell by the questions I asked her about my own situation. And I said, I'm concerned about reintroducing that spiked protein into my body. Do you guys have any data on this? 
Well, to make a long story short, and then her and I went back and forth. It was very polite and very professional. One thing she said, though, that I think all of you should know, and she works within the largest medical system in the state of Iowa. She said, because she mentioned to me that they have some of their own professionals are leery of getting these vaccines, particularly if they already had COVID, she told me. And she goes, while being a staunch advocate of the COVID vaccines overall, she did say internally, we do encourage people that have had COVID to wait at least 90 days before getting the COVID vaccines. And this was the first official recognition I can think of that I've been in front of in this country of trying to balance the interest of and the realities of natural infection vis-a-vis COVID therapeutics. She also said it's going to be, it's probably going to be about a year till we get the data you want. We're just now getting a handle on the efficacy of, of the, 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 of, of, of natural immunity and how it has stood up. And now we are just now getting a handle on truly how many people have been previously infected. We're behind on that. Um, she said to me, the rush was to get therapeutics and vaccines out for people up against a previously unknown virus of, of, of unknown origin. As soon as we can, we're just now getting caught up on what this means for people of, of, who have, who are post infective. I appreciate that honesty as well. Because over the weekend, Anthony Fauci was asked on CNN. Why should somebody who has previously, reco- of all places, CNN, I cannot believe this got asked. Was it on CNN? I think it was on CNN. Okay. I want to, because CNN is where truth, reason, and logic typically goes to die. So when, when an accidental act of journalism occurs there, it absolutely should be noted. Okay. But somebody apparently, I don't know. I mean, CBD oil before going on air. I don't know what it was. Decided, let me try journalism. So the channel that gives us Larry Elder is a white supremacist and a story from AP about California voting irregularities is right wing media. All right. Decided to be the channel that also finally asked Anthony Fauci a question we've been dying for someone to ask for many moons on this show. Why should someone with a recovered COVID case get vaccinated? His answer? I don't know. I don't really know. That was his answer, guys. It's in my Twitter feed. You can watch it for yourself at Steve Day Show. That was his answer. I don't know. I got nothing. Same answer like Aaron gave to Moses and he came down from the mountain with the stablet. It's like, dude, I gave you, you had one job, man. Stop people from worshiping idols and, and the devil for 10 minutes here while I go up and talk to God. You couldn't handle it. I got nothing. I don't know. I don't know what happened, man. I don't know. They started ripping off their clothes, having an orgy, and this golden calf came out. I don't know what happened, man. Not my problem. I, I don't have, got nothing for you. I'm only the, you know, the, I'm only the chief of the friggin' priesthood. What would I know? I got nothing for you. I'm only the chief Levite. The damn priesthood's only named after me. So what, do I, what would I know? Okay, I don't, I don't know. That was Fauci's response. I'm... <laughs> nothing, I got nothing. Now, here's why that was an encouraging response. Number one, it's probably the most honest thing he has said since the middle of March of last year. But number two, what this shows you is that the, the mounting data of natural immunity is becoming so overwhelming and effective that he can't lie. Because if because six months ago, he would not have given that answer. Hell, six weeks ago, prior to the data out of Israel, he might not have given that answer. To me, folks, this is the argument we have to win. We have to reintroduce the concept of natural immunity into this debate. That's part of the two-pronged approach to beating back the debate and the argument for vaccine mandates. The other... The constitutional questions. We'll get into those here in just a moment with our good friend Bob Vanderplot. Stay tuned. So earlier this morning, Federal Reserve, not that we haven't already seen this with our own eyes and felt it in our own uh, pocketbooks, uh, going shopping at the grocery store in the last couple of months, but Federal Reserve put out a warning this morning about continued inflation. And the number one thing where they said we would continue to see inflation skyrocket. Apparently, you can't just like pause an economy. Apparently, you can't like pause a $4 trillion economy and hand out trillions of dollars in loans that people don't have to pay back. So they're just UBI handouts and you just, you know, stay home and Netflix and chill for a year. Apparently, that doesn't work. 
That doesn't that doesn't work. I, apparently, it does not. So as a result of all this money we've printed, inflation will continue to skyrocket. And the number one thing they warned about, can you guys guess? Food. The number one thing they warned about. They said food, energy, and rent. Food was number one. So again, if I'd have, if, if I'd have been talking about my Patriot supply in September of 2019 and said, guys, you never know, you never know when they're not going to have TP for the bunghole, Be- Beavis. You just never know when that might happen to you. And y'all would have laughed like Bob Vanderplot's next to me a snickering right now. Okay? Y'all would have laughed until about March of 2020. Then, literally, poop wasn't funny, was it? All right? It wasn't funny then because it happened. Right? Remember how giddy you started being this time last year when you go to Costco and actually would see the toilet paper on the pallets right you thought steve dace was a handful wait till you get a load of prepper steve dace yes <laughs> you never i'm telling you the next time it might be food that's why you want to get a four-week emergency food supply from our friends at my patriot supply you can save 50 dollars on that right now uh, breakfast lunch dinner drinks even snacks a total of 2,000 calories a day so you and every member of your family will not go hungry and they won't deliver it in the doom prepper van It'll be delivered discreetly to your door, and with the proper storage, it will last for up to 25 years. Again, you get the four-week emergency food supply for each person in your family right now when you go to preparewithdace.com. Again, that is preparewithdace.com. Let's welcome in our snickering friend here next to me, Bob Vanderplatz from The Family Leader. Good to see you, brother. How are you? I'm doing really well. It's good to be back with you guys. It's been a while. It has been a while. I've heard we had some wasp in here. We uh, we had German yellow jackets, and they were nasty. <laughs> and that is not fun either. I no. It is not at all. It was not fun in here, although you got a big laugh at my near-death experience. Well, I got a big laugh at the reaction to your near-death <laughs> experience, but uh, I'm glad everything's safe. I so want to go Joe Pesci. Do it, I amuse it, you? <laughs> like right now, but I won't. Okay. Yeah, Wasp-free, I love it. Anyhow, good all to right. be back. So let's... To me, the, the vaccine mandate debate and defeating this. Sure. Uh, I think we there's there's a there's a three pronged way to counteract this. One immediately is people can, if they want to. Again, you may do your own your own situation and look at your own risk profile. I'm diabetic. I'm 55. I'm 61. I'm morbidly obese. I'm 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 60 with a history of heart disease. You may just decide I, I'm just I just need to get it. That's a, we're having the public policy debate is separate from your personal health choices. We're trying to give you we're trying personal to give you a personal choices. health choice. That's right. Okay. What we're talking about is if you want to escape this mandate. There's three ways out. One is the religious exemption route, and that's where organizations like We the Patriots USA and Liberty Council that we've introduced you to can help with that. The second I just discussed, and that is we've got to bring natural immunity back into the conversation. I talked about a healthcare appointment I had just this morning, and I asked the healthcare professional what her views were uh, if she had heard anything, and she's a specialist, on increased volume of side effects with those who get vaccinated after a recovered COVID infection. And she admitted to me they don't have a lot of good data on that. They're behind in in figuring out how efficacious natural immunity is, how many people were actually uh, really infected with it. Well, to me, that's where we, we go with Israel is showing about the how natural immunity is superior to the Pfizer vaccines immunity. We have to win some form of a medical argument here. And to me, reintroducing tried and true natural immunity is one way of doing it. The third is what I wanted to talk to you about, because this is right in your wheelhouse. So about a decade ago, you nearly pulled off a massive upset in a gubernatorial election with largely running on a singular issue. And that was that the state Supreme Court of Iowa did not have the power to redefine marriage in the state. Now, our state constitution explicitly forbids the courts from making law. It explicitly forbids this. So... It wasn't like th- this was a gray area. They are explicitly forbidden from, from mandating orders of the magnitude that change law in mm-hmm. Iowa. They did this anyway, in clear violation of their enumerated scope. And on those grounds, you ran for governor under the 
under the under the suggestion that as governor, my job would be to execute these laws. I don't execute Supreme Court edicts as law. The Constitution says only the legislature can make a law. Therefore, until the Iowa legislature speaks on the question of what is the definition of marriage, I will I will hold up what the legislature has already said is the definition of marriage and, and, and will defy what the court said, right? Now we have, the, everybody in the Biden administration knows what they're doing is unconstitutional. They know this. They're not even trying to make the case that it is. So then what are the remedies here? And I think this is now where we need counter executive action, like what you said you were willing mm-hmm. to do against the state Supreme Court. So there, there's been 14 governors that have come out across the country, Republican governors saying we're going to sue the Biden administration over this. But in the meantime, should they be enforcing this edict on their people? No. And I believe you bring up a very good point. Uh, as a matter of fact, I've already had uh, a text message back and forth with our governor, Governor Kim Reynolds, who is a bold and courageous governor. I mean, and she does not want to enforce the edict by the Biden administration. And all the governors are basically coming together saying, we're going to sue the Biden administration. But here's the thing. You have President Biden issuing an executive order an unconstitutional executive order mandating a vaccine mandate. We already talked about make your own personal choices. That's not his. We don't live under a dictatorship. And so since we believe in states' rights in the 10th Amendment, why not have the governor say, no, I'm going to issue my own executive order? Uh, We're not enforcing that. And in the meantime, we're going to have a lawsuit. So how this relates back to 2010 when we did this, I said, I'll issue an executive order on day one in my administration, basically to say we're going to uphold the law of one man, one woman marriage until the legislature either redefines marriage or the people of Iowa vote differently. But we're not allowing the court to make this decision for us. So it wasn't like, hey, I'm I'm now the the person in charge. I get to do the mandate. No, we're just restoring the process. Mm So what Kim Reynolds, uh, Christine Noem, Ron DeSantis, these other governors, what they could be doing is saying, no, we're issuing our own executive order until the process plays itself out. But right now we know, and the process here is a lawsuit by saying this is completely unconstitutional. You do not get to do this to our people. I think it makes a lot of sense. And I think the people in individual states are waiting for those leaders to take action. The fear, and I get the fear, is these governors saying, wait a minute, I'm already pointing my finger at Biden for issuing an executive order. Now, I'm going to issue one. Two wrongs don't make a right. Hear what I'm saying. But your executive order is right to hold his executive order that's wrong in check. So it's wrong for a bank robber to point a gun at the teller. Sure. Right? Okay. Okay. It's wrong for the bank robber to do that. But by, and so by doing that, though, by committing that action, the bank robber has, has forfeited or violated some form of, of benefit of the doubt from a, from a rights standpoint, because he is committing an act that is now imposing on the God-given rights of, of someone else, that teller's God-given right to live, right? Yep. Her God, he is threatening her God-given right to life. By committing that offensive action, Therefore, he is now in violation. So would a cop then be wrong by taking him down before Absolutely he pulls not. the trigger on that teller? Absolutely Why? why well, shooting people's bad. Didn't we just say that? Murder's bad, right? But, Killing's but, bad. But it, but it was his action mm-hmm. that caused ah, the, the, the defensive action. So I therefore, see. what you're saying is right. What Biden did. So what you know what Biden's doing is what we've asked people on our side the right to do several times. We don't care if it's wrong or right. We need you to go on a lunatic fringe right now to save babies' lives, mm-hmm. right? Haven't we done said mm-hmm. that stuff? Mm-hmm. What he's doing now, the left is because pushing. the number one thing yeah. that's right is to stop the killing of innocent right. people. Right, and, and so the left now is pushing him, going, "Listen, we don't care if it's constitutional or unconstitutional. We don't care if it's wrong or right. Mandate a vaccine mandate, so we can. I don't know." But whatever their rationale is, and they've gotten him to do it because he knows it's unconstitutional. I guarantee you he knows it's unconstitutional, but he's still willing to do it because he wants to be politically right, politically courageous to show I'm willing to do something. So he has he has violated the social compact here. Like when you go into a bank, there's a social compact there. 
And the compact is that my money will be managed properly in a peaceable environment, right? Mm -hmm. If someone goes in there and disrupts that peaceable environment through a violent threat of their own, they have now violated that social compact. So it no longer is in effect. Right. And therefore now you must commit an action, a defensive action, in order to punish their violation so that then afterwards the social compact may be restored, right? Right. Okay. Because cops don't just walk into banks and start shooting people, right? They shoot somebody who violates the social compact within that structure. The president has violated the social compact here. He is clearly in violation of the United States Constitution. In fact, it's not even unconstitutional. It's anti-constitutional. It's an, it's an intentionally malignant, malfeasant act to overcome the U.S. Constitution. That means that essentially the social compact has now been, dis has been disrupted. Therefore, in my opinion, executives in other states, they, have, they, they took, took an oath to defend their constituents against all enemies, both foreign and domestic. domestic. They, are, they now would be violating their oaths by enforcing further infringements on the God-given liberties and freedoms of their people. They are actually upholding the Constitution by saying, you are in violation of the social compact. We will uphold the spirit that the Constitution was written in by not enforcing your attempts to thwart it. And here's the other thing that would play out is, so Biden issued basically his executive order, vaccine mandate. If these governors or a governor or two said, I'm going to issue my own executive order to do exactly what you're saying. I'm going to protect my citizens. I believe in states' rights. What you now have created from the court's eyes is a constitutional crisis. Because mm -hmm. you got the, the national executive saying this. You got the state executive saying this. You have a constitutional crisis. So what does that do to the speed of a lawsuit? It ramps it up, you know, big time. So therefore, now you get the courts weighing in. And everybody knows any court that's worth its salt is going to weigh in and say, you can't do this because it's unconstitutional. So to me, it makes sense both ways. It's a win-win. Do we know that? Do we have courts worth their well, salt? Well, I mean, I, I get that. This is, this is elementary. This is box one. You it was don't, pretty elementary in 1973 that we don't exactly. tell moms to But, but here's kids. the deal. 19, it was pretty elementary for 6,000 years until Windsor that marriage was between a man and a woman in every totally ethical it. system in the history of planet Earth. So I know you've had Matt Staver on your show. Mm -hmm. And Matt Staver said, when I followed your race— From Liberty for, Council, yeah, by the when, way. When I followed yeah. your race for governor in 2010, he goes, when I heard you are going to issue an executive order on day one, I thought, I don't think you can do that. And he goes, the more I looked at it, the more I thought, I think you can do this. It's exactly what Lincoln, and, that's what the Emancipation right. Proclamation And was. if you did do this, mm -hmm. it would be tested. And so you're right, the Emancipation Proclamation, we talked a lot about that. To me, in 1973, the biggest fail of all is when Nixon, who was under all the garbage of his presidency at that point, when he didn't issue an executive order of his day of saying, not on my watch. Or at least, this. how about the other 49 governors? Exactly. Hey, this is a Texas case. We're not, we're not, we're not doing Amen. that in our state's borders. And to me, this is what the people are looking for. They're looking for leadership. Because what I texted uh, some of my family members when I heard about the vaccine mandate, I said, when you can no longer have the revolution at the ballot box be like, we can count on the revolution at the ballot box. This is why people fire shots. This is why people start yeah, revolutions. We end up in John Brown moments. Yes. That's right. And to me, this is dangerous territory. I agree. And why the people want leaders like our governors to take a stand for such a time as this. So quickly, you got about 90 seconds. Ron DeSantis announced about an hour ago that he is issuing a counter executive order that he will counter fine government agencies that impose Biden's mandates on their employees on a government level. Is that in line with what you're talking about? Is, does that not go far enough? Does, is that adequate? How would you rate that? Well, I, I would rate it probably a B. I, I think it's the right move. I think it's a little bit more complicated than it needs to be. Just issue an ex executive order saying, you know, you're exempt from this in Florida. Mm -hmm. And we'll, we'll take this to the courts. But right now you are exempt in Florida. We don't need the counter fines, all the other stuff. We don't need the complication. To me, the coach of me, keep it simple, stupid. He should an executive order that was wrong, unconstitutional. I'm going to issue an executive order that holds him in check and allows my people in Florida to be free. All right, 30 seconds. What, if anything, as it becomes increasingly obvious that he's running again, what, if anything, should Trump be saying right now? I think Trump should be encouraging these state governors like crazy. 
as a matter of fact, in mobilizing his base or activating his base to encourage these governors, not to bully the governors, but to encourage the governors, do the right thing here. Hmm. You surprised at how quiet he's been about this? I, I really am. And especially since his rally of when he talked about, you guys have to get the vaccine, should get the vaccine. He got, he got booed, booed. booed in yeah. that. And he's taking credit for the vaccine, Operation Warp Speed, all that stuff. I think what he's going to learn running in 2024, if that's what he chooses to do, uh, some things will still play well, but that's not going to play very well with his base. The one thing to give him credit, and I say this as someone who was on a, the competing campaign against him in 2016, as were you. He nice. is he is excellent at shameless um, uh, shifting. Uh, you know, so the idea that he's if, if this issue really goes south, he's I never, just gonna. Hold, I never said he, that. He's gonna go down uh, with a sinking <laughs> ship because it was his idea originally. Oh no, the no. guy knows how to read a room and how yeah. to pivot. That's what makes him a yeah. difficult opponent to beat. When it's Pence, hard to nail Jello to the wall, man. When Pence came to me with Operation Warp Speed, I said, I don't know about. It. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, and we were kind of laughing and stuff. Now this stuff would have us cussing him under yeah. our breaths on the cruise campaign. And we were Trump's, up against it all the time. And Trump's a friend of mine, but you see that understand the environment what you offer yeah, yes yes you just need to know he if if it's great he'll ride it the, the but if he senses he reads that room he's like ooh, things got icy cold in here now uh, we will be pivoting away from that line of apprentice discussion. was not just a tv show that's indeed true thank you brother good to see you good to see you i will right, we'll come back hour two coming your way it is our monday town hall facebook ask me anything we'll find out what questions todd has selected to be answered on the air here in a moment Back with Hour 2, live and on demand here on Blaze TV, radio, and podcast. Steve Dace here with Totters and Aaron McIntyre. And all of you, let us know what you think about what we think via the stevedace.com inbox. You can access that by emailing the show, steve at stevedace.com. That's D-E-A-C-E. Like us on Facebook, where you will get lied to by me with our hashtag Facebook approved takes. Brought to you by the regime. All right. So we lie to you on Facebook and then we tell you what we think everywhere else at Twitter or on Twitter at Steve Dace Show. And then look for me, Steve Dace on MeWe, Parlor, Gab and Getter. Rumble.com slash Steve Dace Show is where you can go as well to get clips of the show that are both free of censorship and then also free to watch. And if you are a podcast listener, boy, do we appreciate you. You played a huge role in the explosive growth of this show for the last couple of years now. Please keep it going. Give us more and more five star reviews if you haven't already already hit subscribe or follow on your podcast preference uh, thank you to all of you that have done those things for us already uh, you guys again have played you're the you're the you're the quiet mvps here of this show so thank you very much uh, we're going to get to our monday town hall here in a mo moment brought to you by though our friends at patriot mobile do you find yourself turning on the news feeling more and more hopeless spending on crazy open borders more mandates lockdowns inflation and the list goes on and on you know there is something we all can do when there is an option to do business with companies that believe what we believe take full advantage of it and that's what you get with patriot mobile america's only pro-america wireless service provider they offer the same broad nationwide coverage as the big boys that hate you because they have the exact same towers that all the major name brands do plus though they've got plans that fit any budget and their 100 percent u.s-based customer service team provides exceptional customer customer support more importantly they share your values, and they will never give the profits you give to them to those causes that are attempting to end us, but those that are attempting to preserve our way of life as well. That's why veterans, first responders, they get even bigger discounts from Patriot Mobile. And right now, if you go to patriotmobile.com slash Steve, again, that's patriotmobile.com slash Steve, or call 972-PATRIOT and use the offer code Steve. You'll get a free activation, and there's always other discounts going on as well. Again, at patriotmobile.com dot com slash Steve or give them a call at nine seven two Patriot. Well, I am I, I am curious to see after weeks of lying to people on our Facebook page, what kind of questions do we generate in response to the paradigm shift over there? So for our Monday town hall this week, Facebook followers, you get to ask me anything. Todd, you went through the questions this week. Did you see Anything that stood out to you, like people were suffering through PTSD, were unsure what questions to now ask, since it's all about the hashtag Facebook approved takes. Did you notice anything like that? It's pretty much 
one topic and one topic only from many different perspectives that is dominating their level of concern. Okay. And you have selected the questions? I have. And I've, of course, not seen these. I like getting hit cold and live with questions. So, Aaron, let us begin. We'll begin with Ryan Ede, who says, If you were eating a steak, what kind would it be and how would it be cooked? What two sides would you have with your steak? Same questions for Todd and Aaron. Now, that is not the topic. It is not all about steak, but that's how we're starting off because there's going to be plenty about what's to come. Okay. Um, I'm a ribeye guy. I like ribeye a lot. It would be medium for me. I don't, I I like it. I like it really pink and juicy. I don't like it like, you know, uh, I don't want to, you know, eat a heartbeat. So it would be medium for me. It'd be ribeye. Although I went to a new sports bar here in town uh, to dinner on Friday. And they had that, um, what's it called? Uh, Is it Wagyu? Is that what it is? A Wagyu beef? Yes. Yeah. They had that there for a steak. And I'm like, I don't know. Do you go to a sports bar and get a steak? Really? But the waitress was like, I'm telling you, all we do is salt and pepper this thing and cook it at the temp you want. I'm telling you. It is as good as what you're going to get at a lot of higher end steakhouses here in town. So I took her word for it. And boy, howdy, was she correct. It was phenomenal. I could not believe how good it was. All right. Just salt and pepper, how tender and everything it was. So, um, you know, that, that may be higher on the list. I just have never seen that. I've never had a chance to eat that before. But for me, a, the ribeye is the go-to um, and medium. And for the sides, um, man, a couple places here in town have phenomenal risotto. I love that for a side. But you've got the standard baked potato. You know, I'm a big uh, baked potato guy. But you know what? When you go to Fleming's, they have phenomenal onion rings. So getting that for a side. So it would be, depending on what mood I'm in, two out of those three. Uh, I would go uh, New York Strip, medium rare. And sides, I'm going to be a little bit more steak-specific focus. Those accoutrements that uh, really kick those up a notch, not like potatoes. But I would go with um, uh, mushrooms and horseradish. Uh, I, I'll take, I, they're smaller cuts of meat, but they're still, I think they're the most delicious is, uh, basically any type of, of actual filet. Mm-hmm. And then I'll take, I mean, I'm, I'll be ugly American here. Uh, just give me, give me some uh, French fries and, um, I don't know, maybe some coleslaw as well. Mm. Uh, next up, this is a two part question. First part from David Akers. How are so many spirit-filled believers deceived by COVID stan? By observation, it must be their diet of mainstream media. Bobby Lee Holland also asks, I find it odd that someone like Jim Jones had followers. There is a freaking bee that just landed on my head. Can you believe this? Wow. It just landed on my head. Did you see that, Todd? I did. Why don't Todd and I cover this question while you get out of here and go to the other studio? I, I thought we were going to be safe, guys. Yeah. I thought we were going to be safe. Yeah, get out of here. Todd and I will handle this as long as we possibly can. The password for that uh, computer, Steve, is Michigan. It's nice. Michigan. Yeah, just just get out of here. Okay, so Todd, are you ready for this? Since you actually selected these questions. I am. Uh, the second question comes from Bobby Lee Holland. I find it odd that someone like Jim Jones had followers who believed so strongly in their religion that they were willing to take a 100% chance of dying for it by drinking the poisoned Kool-Aid. But so many Christians are so afraid of a disease that with a 99% survival rate that they refuse to live without fear. Can you explain this? I literally thought of this while at church today. We are commanded as believers to live in the world, but be not of the world. And many of us have failed at that for quite some time now. We've been groomed to look no different uh, to say, do, and be almost identical to the world at large. N- not And not for a reason. There are reasons to do that. N- the reason is ultimately to find footholds to preach the gospel. But you know, then we're convinced, no, that's just preachy, that's just judgy. Our, our biggest concern 
is to be just like everyone else. And that's why this is. And, and it starts off right with that great cradle with fear. And I've told you about this before, but we, the number of uh, my, my children were born at home with a midwife. And back when that uh, was occurring, then the number of people who would ask me, well, are, aren't you afraid of something terrible happening? Like, no, no, not at all. I mean, it, it's not outside of the realm of possibility. Terrible things can happen. Terrible things can happen once your children turn 16 and you give them the car keys. You, don't, you cannot be paralyzed by this all the time, but right from birth, more than ever before, really, the, we, we, you are more likely to be safe and healthy these days for reasons of sanitation, for reasons of diet, uh, for reasons of hygiene than ever before. But the level of neuroses that the modern American parent has over little Timmy and Bobby is more profound than ever before. And almost in every other generation, at least before the last two, death within childhood was a far greater reality. But faith... While it certainly goes on a roller coaster throughout all of human history, uh, it was there generation after generation after generation to tell us that it's ultimately the things of heaven are where we plant our flag. And we are not allowed to be afraid. We are not allowed to be hopeless. That is such a great gift of God for him to command that of us because we want to be hopeless. We want to be afraid. We're not allowed to. God says so. So stop. And once you do, it doesn't mean that life is easy. There's a lot of hurdles. There's a lot of roadblocks. But when it, it limits our choices. And quite frankly, in many ways as human beings, we need those choices limited by God himself. Certainly not by Joe Biden, who thinks he's God now, but by God himself. The commandments. Here, do this. You'll be okay. We, we as believers, and it's good. I, I, the fact that you were sitting there in church and having that eureka means uh, there's some Holy Spirit uh, power going on there. You're, and I don't think you're even remotely close to alone. There's a lot of people sitting in church, myself included these days, which is why, as you know, I approached uh, my own deacon. And what was that, three weeks ago, a month ago? said, so, you know, no, you don't get to use that pulpit for that. There's just a lot of nonsense going on. You, you, you're, you're attending the Oprah show a lot. You just feel good, feel good, feel good. There's, look around you. You shouldn't feeling, be feeling good a lot about a lot of things right now. And attached to this answer... Is, uh, I'm kidding. God bless all you guys for everything you do for us on the Steve Day Show. But you're asking me to like type out for you questions to ask, to tell you like where to fight. I I don't know my backyard, your backyard, like you do. Maybe you've got a fantastic school board in a fantastic school district. But have you looked yet? I don't care if you have kids or not. You're a taxpayer there. What have you done on that front? You need to get involved. You know better than I do in your backyard what that's going to take. And if you listen to this show every day, you also know the questions to ask by now. Keep it simple. Three, five, I don't know. It doesn't have to be that complicated. They don't have answers over there. Keep it simple. Aaron? That was outstanding, Todd. Thank you for continuing to talk while I got up and went to a different room to try to troubleshoot. We do have Steve on now. Steve, you can hear us and... And uh, I can hear you as well. Let me rephrase that question real quick for you. The, the question is simply, why are so many otherwise spirit-filled believers in the gospel and of Jesus Christ, why are so, uh, so many otherwise spirit-filled believers so taken captive by COVID stan? Um, the proverb says, bad company corrupts good character. Paul says in the New Testament that we can't be conformed to the thoughts and patterns of this world, but we have to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. 
Um, there is very, on a, on a systemic level, there is a chronic l- low level of discipleship uh, that has gone on uh, in the American church for about a generation now, as there has been far more uh, of, of a focus on how to get more and more people into church, as opposed to, do, to what in the heck do we do with them now that they're here? Um, uh, people hear a salvation message over and 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 over again. And we, we should be preaching repentance and salvation over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. I mean, that, that is, that is the, the foundational exchange of, of a relationship with Jesus Christ. But that's, as I've used this analogy before, just as a wedding ceremony itself is the foundational those exchange of those vows— that is not the whole of the relationship. That, that's, that's the pronouncement of one. But, but the relationship carries forward, and it is assumed that you will grow more intimately together. Um, and that's what the assumption is in this relationship as well. The problem with that is, though, that if we're constantly feeding our, our minds with the things of this world as opposed to the things of the, the world to come or the kingdom to come— then um, you end up what you think about all day long, and the way you think about it, you will eventually become. And and this can go the other way. You know, I got an email today from someone I've not had a chance to answer yet, whose father is elderly and diabetic and, and is, is 100% in belief. He doesn't want to do anything the Bible doesn't say. Well, that's not sola scriptura. That is solo scriptura. That's different. The, the, you know, um, the, the Bible says not to smoke, doesn't have anything to say about smoking crack cocaine. It's just kind of hermeneutically implied not to do things like that. Okay. So you can take this the other way too, where you can now, you can turn even a love for God's word into an idol. And that's the thing. Our hearts are idol making factories that, that they're pumping out idols constantly. That's why we have to die daily. That's why we have to pick up our cross. Okay. That's why we have to do this. We renew this commitment inwardly within this sanctification process all of the time, because the flesh that, that this mortal coil is, is surrounded by and is drowning in desires to be the dog returning to its own vomit and wants to over and over and over and over again. I mean, the heart is deceitful above all things. So that's really what this is, is, is it's a byproduct of a lack of, of discipleship. And therefore, a lot of people are just following rote. I go back to the conversation I, I mentioned last hour, guys, with the healthcare professional that I had with my consultation this morning. I would bet you, I'd be willing to bet money that I am the, I mean, this is, she is, uh, you know, the Iowa Heart Center is, is one of, if not the, here in Des Moines, the preeminent cardiovascular specialist institution in the state of Iowa, or at least that's not on a university campus. I would bet you, I'll bet you money, I'll bet you my next paycheck on Wednesday that I am the first person that has asked her her thoughts on post-COVID recovery vaccination as it relates to the volume of side effects in those cases. That's not good, guys. I'll I'll bet you a a community college graduate here that does a a, a show for the blaze. And I mean, that, that waiting room was packed today. The parking lot was packed. Heart disease is the number one killer in America by far. Uh, so there's never a shortage of patients. I'll, I'd be willing to bet you, without even sight unseen, I'll put my paycheck Wednesday on the line. I'm the first person to ask this doctor this question. That is a problem. And that goes to the lack of independent and critical thought. See, the enemy lies and says that a belief in God's word is will close your mind and will discourage critical thinking. It's the exact opposite. If I go to fix a vehicle and I have some general knowledge about internal combustion engines, I could probably, you know, uh, do some level of damage in there for the good. But ultimately, I'm going to come to a situation where I lack the sufficiency of knowledge if I don't know the manufacturer's manual to this model. Because I didn't make this vehicle. And nobody knows more about this vehicle than the manufacturer does. 
That's what the Bible is. It's the it's the manufacturer's manual, except it gets shared with us. We're all invited to read it, so we know how this thing called humanity and creation both actually works, but then was intended to work, and then how it will work when that when that divide and chasm is is rectified. There's a lot of believers. Remember the poll out last year that showed a majority of believers didn't know what the Great Commission was. And there's just a lot of people right now that have that have been saved, but have not been discipled. And I think that this the all these things you're asking about right now are examples of this. Well said. Up next, Tamara Balkus says, since we are unable to bring a lawsuit against the pharmaceutical companies for vaccine injury or death, can we bring a lawsuit against our employer if they mandate the COVID vaccine? Seems like employers assume liability for COVID vaccine injury or death if they mandate the jab as a condition of employment. OSHA originally said, yes, you could. And now it's claiming that that they're exempt. OSHA has no power to make that declaration. A court will. So th- that answer will will lie in a vaccine injury that goes to court, that someone sues their employer for it happening to them. I will tell you, I had this conversation with our CEO here, Tyler Carden, a few weeks ago, and I think I mentioned this to you guys before. He is just incredulous at the amount of corporations. You know, and, and, and guys, he's CEO of a multi-million dollar company here called Blaze Media, multi-million dollar company, all right? And he is incredulous at the amount of CEOs that are lining up to assume all of this risk of liability upon themselves. So the answer is, you know, the courts are going to decide that ultimately. And eventually, if this continues, that will absolutely get adjudicated. And this this is really important. That's why don't quit. Exactly. They have yes. to fire you. There was yes. a great nurse. Yep. Did you, The video I posted it on my social, she she. She just kept showing up to work, even though people there kept telling her she needed to get vaccinated and they thought it, she would just like give up. And she says, no, I'm here and you're going to have to fire me. Otherwise, I'm going to do my shift of that. Do not quit under any circumstances. Eric Bailey is next. He asks, do you think that full stadiums without masks and without the corresponding mass extinction events will help people to wake up to the lie? Um. Yes and no. Um, in, 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 in evangelism, there's several different forms of evangelism. And one of the forms of evangelism uses apologetics. All right. And so there's been great best selling books like uh, two of them, two of the greatest ever written by Josh McDowell, More Than a Carpenter, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And there is a percentage of people on an intellectual level that can be persuaded that are that are critical thinking enough that 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 have that have that are spiritually open enough that they can be persuaded by objective reasoning like what's in Josh's two momentous works but this is also where total depravity comes in it's it's not that they're it's not that they're lazy Bob to quote one of my favorite movies Office Space, it's that they just don't care. Sinners don't care. And I think a lot of apologetics encourages already believing people to know that their that their faith and conversion was not simply uh, an emotional reaction that there's real reason behind it that intellectually that they can now have confidence to go out and defend their belief system in a pluralistic community or society. I don't know, though, how many people that really love their sin, as we all do, because we're, again, our hearts are idol-making factories. I don't know how many people who love their sin are are like, you know what, man, my girlfriend and I were tagging it last night um, without, you know, getting married. And, you know, and, and even though she's really hot, I, you know, I just read, I read Josh McDowell's more than a carpenter last night. So, I, you know, I'm just going to uh, put it in my pants, keep it in my pants, you know, and uh, tell her to get her own place until we get married and do it right. Maybe th- I'm sure Josh, who's been one of the most, if not the most successful American evangelist of the last 50 years, I'm sure he has encountered some stories like this. But by and large, as long as the hot girlfriend keeps letting you tag her outside of marriage, she's you're going to be far less inclined to believe in something that caught that will compel and convict you to stop tagging outside of marriage. See, see my point? And I, I think so. I think there is a there is another layer of people that we can reach 
with this level of objective, real-time reasoning for sure. So I, I, I absolutely think it, it is productive. But I also don't think it's determinative because of what we just discussed a few minutes ago. There's a lot of people that don't want to let this go. There's a lot of people that there is no objective data you can show them. They don't want to let it go. And this is where, this is, you know, what was the best antidote for the early church? Ultimately, as much as, as much as no human has been more influential on the early church, on the, on the history of the church than Paul, it, 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 and as brilliant as his writings and epistles are, more people over the, over the eons and the generations have been converted by watching the countercultural way Christians live than even by the most eloquent of words Paul writes in his magnum opus, Romans. In fact, they're often, they're often, they often become spiritually open by watching the countercultural way Christians live. And then Christians are like, well, here's where we got some of these ideas. You should read this Paul guy and kind of the things he said. And then, then there's that Jesus dude, and he's God, so we kind of follow him. We're living the way he told us to. I think that model applies here too. So yes, there's a layer of people that are like, you know what? I knew something wasn't right about this. And I'm freaking sick of it anyway. And look at all these people at all these games living their life. Screw this noise, man. I'm, I'm, I'm five, you know, poor one out. I'm done with this. There is a layer of people that that applies to. Otherwise the stadiums wouldn't be full. So yeah, there is some productivity there. But determinative, what's going to determine this ultimately is when a critical mass of people say, no, no, and not just at a ball game, but, a, you know, a critical mass of parents send their kids to schools without any masks. No, the answer is no, we're not doing this. Nope. And, that, and I think that, that ultimately is what is going to win the day. Who's got the most conviction here? Who's got the most conviction? And what you saw with the president last week is COVID stand was again in retreat again in. And so what has COVID stand done every time it's been put in retreat? It has come back later with an even worse attempt at tyranny than what it was doing previously. And so what that means is there's never going to be a point in time that the Japanese voluntarily start, stop, stop sending kamikaze pilots you're going to have to unload a weapon on them that makes them think, oh, snap, I guess our kamikaze pilots don't work anymore. And that's what's going to have to happen here. And that, that, that weapon is mass noncompliance and defiance. And ultimately, COVID Stan realizes that these things just aren't enforceable any longer. Anything short of that, though, and this will continue until morale improves. Yeah, I'm very, very concerned about the bread and circuses aspect of this. We on our side were left with some pretty bad choices. As we talked about last week, in order to get back to normal, the two fronts we were fighting on is you stop shutting down the schools and, and uh, the Big Ten early on. Uh, but it put us in the awkward, you know, getting back to school, what? So they can just learn about CRT and rainbow flags? No, that's, and this is the point Steve is making. You know, it, it, it can't just be enough to go back. It's to realize how often you were lied to even before COVID all of which led to COVID. And so you need to stop it now because over in France, they've been in the streets for nine weeks. Maybe getting back to the ball games is a version of that, people having their cake and eating it too, but I'm skeptical. It's not good enough just to go back to the games if you're going to say, well, passports are good too because I just need my ball game. That ain't going to fly. They'll, as Steve said, they're going to come back worse than ever before if that's your bottom line. It's time to uh, tear down the high places, a la the uh, Old Testament kings of Israel, is what I'm hearing you say, Todd. Yeah. Next question comes from Josh Greiner. Now that the quote-unquote president is saying he must protect the vaccinated from the unvaccinated, who are we supposed to be doing all this for anymore? Are the, uh, are the vaccinated people the new most vulnerable? I, I mean... If, 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 I had, if I had tweeted out or posted on Facebook even a few months ago that if you're vaccinated, you are not protected against coronavirus around people who are unvaccinated, I, I'd have been suspended or if not outright banned from every major platform. But that is the exact stance that the president is currently articulating. And so I asked this question again, how come I was able to return from Haiti after being vaccinated before arriving for that mission trip 
and being around one of the most unvaccinated and the poorest nations in our hemisphere. How come I was allowed back and there was no fear that I would bring back with me whatever it is that is, um, you know, obviously infecting the Haitians that I had to be vaccinated against? How come that does not apply here? Uh, the idea that if you're vax, see, I actually think the paradigm's the other way around from what I am saying. From what I am seeing is that, and we'll get into more of this tomorrow, okay? Uh, I'm going to lay out some data from you, and it's hard to come by, but there are a few states that have provided us data from vaccinated to unvaccinated and what it looks like right now in their states with hospitalizations and things of that nature. Uh, I, I actually would like a question, the other question answered. When we have a breakthrough case amongst the vaccinated, if they don't succumb to systems where, or to symptoms, where does their viral load go then? Where does it go? I, I'd like to get the question to that one answered the other way around. Well said. We're heading to break here, Steve. Uh, more on the Steve Dace Show. Facebook, Ask Dace Anything coming up in just a little bit. Back here again on the Steve Dace Show, where I get to tell you about one of my absolute favorite products known as Built Bar. It is the best tasting protein bar you have ever had, I promise you. And it's about the most nutritious candy bar you'll ever try. Now, they won't call it a candy bar. I just think it tastes like one. It has the same rich flavor and texture as a candy bar, but none of those fillers. Instead, it's loaded and packed with protein, and it is low in carbs, low in sugar, and low in calories. You cannot do better than Built Bar. You can get the variety box with all the great regular everyday flavors like coconut, uh, cherry barcia. Everybody loves cookies and cream. I love mint brownie. Or or you can also get their specialty flavors that are phenomenal, like chocolate chip cookie dough, for example. Uh, some of the others we've tried, like birthday cake, you won't, uh, you, you won't regret this. Go to Built.com, use the promo code DACE right now, D-E-A-C-E, -E, at Built.com to get 15% off your order from Built Bar, the best protein bar ever. At Built.com and use the promo code DACE to get... 15% off. Let's get back to our Monday town hall. Facebook, ask me anything. Aaron. We'll go next to Jeff Allen, who says, Steve, honest question. We have statistics and hear updates on almost all countries on various COVID data, with the exception of one all too important country, China. We don't see or hear anything from them in the media. What is the state of COVID at the origin of this debacle? My guess is the average Chinese citizen has long forgotten about the virus. That is an excellent question. I and, and let me confess, it has been months since I have checked in on China. Uh, I did it. I did it regularly last year. I have rarely done it this year. Remember, early on, our media was actually citing verbatim the data from China that like 10 people had died or it wasn't that low. It was just a ridiculous number. And they were citing it verbatim at face value when it was clearly not true. I will tell you that kids went back to school in Wuhan, not just all of China, in Wuhan before they did here. Um, a, a lot of China was not locked down last year. Wuhan was quarantined, but in a lot of other places in China, you could go um, you couldn't travel there, but if you lived there, you could even go to a restaurant or a club. Um, they reopened to their public before we did. They tried to reopen their theaters a few times uh, to no avail, and then ultimately were able to get them opened permanently before ours. So um, those might be, and I will I'll also say that Apple reopened its stores in China before they reopened them here too. And those might be the objective markers that I would look at because obviously governments lie and and communist governments lie even more. So I would be looking at, you know, what's a company that is, um, you know, publicly shared like an Apple that can't just get away with, you know, lying to millions of, of shareholders and can't open up, you know, the hundreds of stores they have in China if it's not safe, what are they doing? Same thing with movie studios and, and movie theaters. Though I might be looking at, if I wanted to know what was really going on in China, I'd probably be looking at those barometers from, those are entities that are not covered by a military that can point guns at unruly citizens, but instead they've got to make a profit in order to pay out a dividend uh, and to pay back their investors and their bills. If you wanted to know what was really going on in China, I'd probably be looking at that more than anything else. All right. 
Moving on, we'll go to Cindy Gosset, who says, In all sincerity, do you have any thoughts on who is actually running the country? Um, I think here this is this is this is this is my brutally honest assessment of the situation. That I I believe a um, a Politburo or oligarchy of administrative entities from uh, the Pentagon to various depart the State Department to DOJ are are basically just running this thing as a cabal. And and Joe Biden is trotted out and brought out when they either think he's had enough. Ad I, and this isn't a joke. It's what I really believe. When they think he's either having a really good day and dementia patients have their good days and bad days. When they think he's having a really good day or they pumped him up with enough stimulants like Adderall to make to give off the appearance of a good day so that you can have the public posture of a president like what you see in banana republics or uh, tyrannical ones. But but on a day to day grind, it's why you don't see Kamala Harris out there. On a day to day grind, I believe the administrative state is running the country. How much Obama? Um, indirectly a lot, because I think a lot of those are people that are um, in, indirectly are direct have direct ties with him and his era. Uh, you know, I don't know that Barack Obama is the voice on the speakerphone, like in Charlie's Angels, actually calling the shots. Frankly, I think that if he were, um, I think things would probably be coming across a little bit smoother than they currently are. And I think the, the haphazard way in which things are often done, um, I think is indicative of when you have uh, too many chiefs and not enough Indians, too many cooks in the kitchen. That's that's indicative of different factions that kind of all have an idea of how best to pursue the agenda, uh, particularly as it relates to their particular subsect of it uh, or subset of it and um, and and their particular mission and goals within that subset. And at times those things are going to conflict. Uh, so but but I don't I, I think he has very limited decision making process whatsoever. I, I think he's absolutely a figurehead. You bet. Next question, we will go to Kenneth Rickard, who asks, Steve, is Ron DeSantis' strategy of using the mass distribution of monoclonal Regeneron tech and keeping things wide open during the summer surge an initial sweetification, you know, using historically normal strategies to fight diseases spread, to increase naturally acquired immunity in an attempt to prevent a similar surge next summer during campaign season? If so, do you think it's a wise strategy? No, I don't believe that. Um, if anything, they were already doing that maybe prior to the the rollout of, of of Regeneron or the monoclonal antibodies. I think I think the rollout of Regeneron and the monoclonal antibodies goes to what I said on this show a couple of months ago, that if you are going to offer um, a, you know a, a control group, then you don't just need a counter narrative about how the the current um, you know uh, non pharmaceutically uh, introduced remedies don't work like lockdowns masks things of that nature that you need you can't just say those things don't work I mean we can say those things we're not running a state twenty some odd people twenty some odd million people aren't relying on me to some varying degree for their way of life so we can just do that I mean we we can just play defense attorney poking holes at the prosecution's case and pointing out where it is weak and they lack sufficient evidence for a conviction. We can do that. But if we were governing, that wouldn't be sufficient. Because if you're, if, if you're going to say those things don't work, remember, solutions trumps values. It, people respond to bad solutions nowadays more than they respond to values. They, they don't respond en masse to just a generic or general proclamation of freedom. We just had that conversation last segment about, you know, even believers getting themselves completely worked over by COVID stan. You know, people react to solutions nowadays. That's why we can't just win gun arguments on Second Amendment. Okay, well, my, you know, I believe in the Second Amendment too. My kid got into my gun case, blew his head off. So where's my Second Amendment now? My kid's dead. 
right? And that's where the other side jumps in and says, see, 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 if you didn't own that gun, your kid would still be alive. We need to respond with solutions. Hey, that girl was going to get raped on her campus. She pulled out a gun, the rapist fled, or she pulled the trigger, and now the rapist is dead, so no one else is getting raped by him again. See, there's your solution. Hey, my elderly grandparents live out in the sticks. They were, you know, uh, 50 miles from a prison. There was a prison break. Their home got invaded. Police couldn't get their 911 for 10 minutes. Grant Thankfully, Grandpa had a shotgun and handled matters on his own. So they're still alive. See, we need to respond with solution-oriented language and narrative. The, the Gone is the era of just, we just assume certain value, transcendent value-oriented or, language in our culture. We do. That's why you're watching and listening to a show like this. The vast majority of the populace, including, frankly, too many people that vote the way we do, don't anymore. So we have to have solution-oriented language and narrative. So it wasn't going to be just enough for DeSantis to point out masks don't work, because then he'd be dealing with newspaper headlines every day. Look at the, sky, look at the skyrocketing case count. If only we were using masks. Well, masks don't work. They come back with, well, even if they work 1%, wouldn't that be better than what we have right now? And off we go. He had to come up with an alternative narrative. That's why I suggested he needed to focus on early treatment on this show a couple of months ago. I don't know. Maybe some of his people listen, or they came up with this same idea independently. But about a week or two later, they understood that they had to start focusing on alternative treatments. And that's when they began the rollout with the monoclonal antibodies. So it, it, it's not just enough to say that the, the statist regime narrative fails. When we, 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 when we elect people, they still have to, uh, to affirmatively govern. And we don't live in an era where people want to be seen as the solution is nothing. So we have to have better solutions, just as, just as we couldn't cast out Islamic radicalist uh, theology with a military in Afghanistan and Iraq— but only a good theology beats a bad theology. We can't cast out the failure of COVID stand solutions with no alternative solutions. It's ultimately going to take good solutions to counter bad ones, right? And so they needed alternative frameworks to offer people other than masks and, 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 and lockdowns don't work. Okay, well, now I'm in a panic, so now I kind of think they work. And I really just want someone to give me something that works because someone I care about or me, myself, is sick and I don't know what to do. Well, now you have a counter narrative. If anything, they should have gone to this narrative earlier. And if anything, they should be more aggressive with this narrative in advancing things like ivermectin cocktails as well as the monoclonal antibodies. Next up, we'll go to Angela Snyder who asks, can I identify as a congressperson so I can avoid a vaccine mandate? <laughs> or maybe a United States Postal Service worker. Yeah, That's only one of the largest employers of the federal government, and they're exempted from it. So I don't know why you can't. I don't, why don't, in fact, why not just go, what was her name again, Aaron? I'm sorry. Angela. Angela, why not just go all the way and identify as vaccinated? There you I go. identify as vaccinated. Why not just do that? It's airtight by their logic. Yeah. I mean, if I, I, I don't, I mean, frankly, as someone who has a documented recovery uh, from a case of COVID, I have far more scientific grounds to identify as vaccinated than a man does to claim he has a uterus. And it's not even close. Uh, Spring Olmsted asks, are hospitals lying about vaccinated patients' admissions, especially when Massachusetts and Connecticut have admitted more than 30% of uh, admissions are vaccinated? Anything's possible right now. I mean, I, I don't know the answer to that. And, I, I, and we'll get into this more with fake news or not tomorrow. I spent a, you know, a good deal of time on a Friday afternoon on a beautiful day trying to pour through as many state dashboards as I could before we had dinner reservations. The, the amount of states that don't pre even provide this information is extremely high. And then there is a few states like Ohio that they do provide information about vaccinated versus unvaccinated, but the data they give you is, is slanted because it's cumulative, meaning what they will tell you, and you'll see this tomorrow, what they will tell you is the amount of cases and, and, and infections and deaths from the vaccinated since they started vaccinating. Well, that, that's not the argument. That's not the argument. No one, not even Todd, if you go back and watch and listen to our shows in January, February, and March, 
was arguing about the initial promising, promising efficacy of the vaccines. Nobody was. That's not the argument. The argument we're having is that over time, the trend line is waning. And so I don't, you know, the, 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 the global numbers don't matter. What matters is the numbers of the trend line right now, because you're using these numbers to justify imposing on my freedom. And so getting this data is hard. And that, that should make you very, very suspicious. You know what you should also be suspicious of? Real estate agents who promise you the world. Even somebody with the resources of a Glenn Beck ran into this. A real estate agent that promised him the world and then when the time came, could not deliver those results. And he got so frustrated to put out the call to this audience one day and found out that there were actually reliable agents in this audience that could help people like Glenn and others in this audience if we just networked them together and connected them. And out of that frustration and effort, was born a company known as realestateagentsitrust.com. And now this thing has really grown to the point that just about anywhere in the country you want to move away from or move to, we can probably find you an agent that you can trust who comes complete with a fully vetted track record of success as well. So check out again the site. The name kind of says it all, especially for these unprecedented times. Bing. Thank you. Go to realestateagentsitrust.com again realestateagentsitrust.com. All right. Two more super, super fast here because we only got a couple minutes left. Uh, we'll go to David Powers. What does a normal tar and feathering take? Like how many feathers and how much tar per tyrant? Asking for a friend. You can't have too much. That is the correct answer. Let's, how about this? Let's mess around and find out. Yes. That's, that's even better. <laughs> Over the top. Well done. Uh, Christopher yeah. Bates finally asks, will you be the first in line for an experimental WASP vaccination? <laughs> yes. That question was on the table before what happened today. So I think we know the answer to it now. I mean, guys, I came in today confident we were finally past this, man. And, and then just to have it landed on my head. That's the most brazen act yet. Thankfully, Aaron was talking at the time, so the camera was not on me. <laughs> and I, I can't believe I didn't get stung. You know, you that re, it's a reflex just to shoo whatever's on your head. I mean, it was, it was firmly planted on my head. I cannot believe when I went to smack at it like that, it did not sting me. That is, I'm just going to chalk that up to Providence. It's super okay? weird. They seem to be attracted to you. I'm telling you. I'm telling you, man. It's Lord of the, it's Beelzebub kind of stuff, man. Because I, like, it's like, it's I, like the science teacher in the new Spider-Man film, witches. I'm telling you, it is. It, it, you know what? Nefarious. The filming's getting going again. It's like the, it's like the flies and mosquitoes that invaded the Amityville house when they tried to exercise that home. No, it, I believe the enemies. He's unleashed the hounds on me, man. Apollon, Abaddon, the pit has been yes. opened, and I'm the target at this it's point. It's because you have the diet of a 12 year old boy. They're coming after all that sweet stuff in you. You think they're coming after all that <laughs> apple cider vinegar in me? Heck no. It is interesting. They did land on my head. They, they took one look at you yeah. and he was like, hell no, I'm not here, man. <laughs> that dude's way too acidic for me. Yeah. That's never happening. Way to hang with it, Come. boss. Are we done? We are right, done. We're yeah. around, do the overtime. We'll see the rest of you tomorrow. Until then, John 317.